Uh, hey, the way she goes up. No. <laughs> Hello and welcome. This is episode 15 of the Paul Ryder Tapes. My name is Angela Smith and I'm the ex-wife of Paul Ryder. And in the months leading up to his tragic death in July of 2022, he sat down with me in several recording sessions to tell his complete life story, all of the highs and all of the struggles. And he told this story with complete and utter honesty that's really blowing everybody away. Coming up in this episode. We were just sat in the hotel bar one night, uh, at the bar, and this guy came and sat next to me. I thought nothing of it. And then I kind of glanced to the left of me and was like, fucking hell, Mickey Rock sat next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just read that he was a Mondays fan as well. What's going on with the, with the bin liners? Why have you got bin liners gaffered to the wall? Um, and, and where's your windows? And this guy had sold the windows and the window frame so that he could get money, so that he could buy some more heroin. I was bringing my dog in the other day, right? and a bloke at the end of the street says, oh, I believe a happy Mondays lives down here. No, I don't know, mate. <laughs> Fuck that, I don't want anybody knowing where I live. Jesus, bad enough now. On a serious note, Anybody let's go now, everyone else is dead. <laughs> if it was on my own, if I didn't have family and, yeah. and, and kids and stuff, yeah. and I didn't have a band, I'd probably be travelling around the world, yeah. up in the Himalayan mountains somewhere, yeah. smoking Nepalese temple balls. Can you adjust your chair so that you're slightly angled that way? Like that. Yeah, just so that, like, you're not so much of. Never mind, actually, those are a bit better. Be, be like that. Yeah. Very uncomfortable right now. Why? Right. If I sit oh, like I'll this. Just face me, it's fine. Oh, I've not got my lipstick on. Oh my oh. god. Hang on, sorry, I've got to put my lipstick on. <laughs> oh god. Right. You ready? Yeah. We're recording. Okay. So we're back again, um, three weeks after mm -hmm. the last time we recorded something. And I've just run out to get my lipstick on because when you're doing a podcast, you have to wear lipstick. Okay. But you're not wearing any. <laughs> no, I'm not wearing no. lipstick. So we left off the last episode in the early noughties. You'd started a new band called Big Arm that was going really well and you'd supported Ian Brown on two tours. You'd also tried a strange detox substance called Ibogaine and set about helping to promote it. And I've been digging in the archive and I found a short clip shot by our friend Alan Howard following your promotion of Ibogaine. Let's have a look at it. My name's Paul Ryder. Some of you might know me from the rock band Happy Mondays. Not only was we a good band, but we was infamous for taking lots and lots and lots of drugs. Unfortunately, it wasn't a myth. And I ended up with a big, big, big problem. And I've struggled for many years in and out of uh, rehabs until I stumbled across a substance called Ibogaine from the West Central African rainforest and it's completely transformed my life. I just think it's incredible and I do think it's a miracle because my dad's tried so many times in the past to to get better and to to stop his addiction but it's just never worked before. So I'm on a mission. Number one, I need to know all about the science and history of this substance. Number two, I need to spread the word about Ibogaine and do my best to campaign for it to be brought into the medical mainstream. Okay, I'm on my way to Stockholm. I'm going to meet Michael, um, former heroin addict who's been treated with Ibogaine. Michael's organised um, a lecture. I'm going to go over and say a few words, spread the word. Fellow Ibogaine warriors, I'm off. Come on, going to be late. Okay, so this is Michael, my fellow Ibogaine warrior. Um, 
And like you say, you've done a lot of different detoxes and cold turkeys. What was different about the Ibogaine detox for you? It's, it's the strongest thing that ever happened to me. So I thought, who the heck tricked me into this? Who made me do this? <laughs> was this a setup all from the beginning? And, uh, Isn't that weird? Because I thought that as well yeah, when it started to work for me. Yeah. You're kind of coming from the same school of thought as I am, that, that people need to know about this. And, and... So where are we, Michael? Well, we are in the middle of Stockholm. It's a place called Sergel's Toy. This is where the street dealing goes on. And it's Stockholm's equivalent to kind of like Dam Square in Amsterdam. Or oh, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. That's good. Cool. And uh, I'm going to pass out some of these flyers here because okay. so many addicts hang around here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably come scoring down here as well one day. In fact, I'm sure I've been here late at night once. I got a phone call from you um, um, about the idea of doing a doing a pilot um, on the use of ibogaine, which is this African um, uh, root or something, um, which you take, you go on this like insane hallucinogenic trip for God knows how long, and then you come back um, and all of the cravings that you had um, for heroin are gone. That was, that was what we, that was what we'd heard. That was what it was supposed to do. Right, we've only been down here like three minutes and, and like there's four or five uh, obviously using addicts. Uh, I've zoomed in on Michael and uh, kind of like want to know more of what's going on. Uh, if you look at them, it's just like they've had the soul sucked right out of them. And I know exactly where they are because I've been there. And your soul does get sucked out of you. You know, you're walking around like, like little ghosts of Scooby-Doo. If you're a heroin addict, it gives you a window of about a month to kind of get your therapy in, get connected with people who can help you before your cravings start to come back. So it does definitely work in terms of taking away the urge to use heroin, but the, the uh. effects don't last forever. And they also recommend a second dose about a month later, and then it lasts a bit longer. But the idea, it's not like a quick fix. It's just like a stay of execution, really. Like you, it, it takes away the, the desire to use, and then the onus is on you to get your therapy in, to get your support system together oh, yeah. in that window of time. So yeah, it, it was successful in the, in the short term, it took away the desire to use, for sure. But it doesn't come without risks. What you can hear behind is Patrick and Michael setting up for tonight. Um, they're a bit nervous, and I'm a bit nervous as well. It's a bit like doing a gig, um, and you've got no idea exactly how it's going to go or whether anyone's going to turn up, but let's just go. I, I, I went with Paul. Um, we were travelling around various places in, in, in Europe, around, around France and um, Sweden. Um, I think and what he was trying to do was to, was to educate people about Ibogaine. It's, um... I don't know, I, I had visions of like one person turning up, but then again, that's my head. It's like when I do concerts, knowing I've sold 20,000 tickets, I still think, shit, what if no one turns up? You know, but this, this is great already. Hi everyone, my name's Paul, and um, I used to be a drug addict. Um, First of all, I have no financial interest in this stuff whatsoever. Um, I just need to get a message out to uh, uh, other drug addicts that there's a different way of life. And we went to a couple of different places where, where he was working with a guy who was actually doing talks um, about how Ibogaine can work. Um, and they were, pulling, they were pulling in crowds to these different um, rehabilitation centres. And there was, one place that, there was one place that we went to where Part of what you have to do when you're filming a crowd like that um, is that you have to let people know that this could be going out on TV, so therefore we kind of need their permission. So, so there was probably about, I don't know, 60, 70 people crammed into this room, and I've got a camera at the back, um, and I kind of had to do a bit of an announcement beforehand saying, just to let you know, guys, if you, if you don't want to be on camera, then if you sit to the left-hand side of the room... Um, you won't be on camera, but anybody who is in camera will just see the back of your head, so it'll be fine. Um, so I was kind of hoping that I'd just have this nice shot with everybody sitting there, um, and it would look like a really busy, busy um, event, which it was. Um, but obviously, 10 seconds after I said that, you turn to your left, and there's 70 people crammed into the corner, 
and not one single person sitting in front because not one single person wanted to be on camera, kind of understandably. Um, but yeah, so that, did, that as a shot didn't work out very well. And I do hope one day that these people in government that are actually clueless about addiction will listen to people like myself, Patrick and Michael and maybe, um, maybe we could help a lot of people with this. Do you remember filming Paul when he actually took the Ibogaine? You were there when he, when he took it? Yeah, it was quite a big thing because there'd been quite a big build up to it. Um, we'd spent a couple of weeks traveling around in this, in this, in this old Jeep um, telling the story um, of it and, it and and spreading the word. I hope everybody gets something out tonight. Do you remember being nervous for him about that? Like, because obviously there were cases where people had actually died doing this uh, treatment. Did it? Yeah, concern? I mean, you know, I mean, when you work at MTV, you're kind of around drugs quite a lot, quite a lot of the time, and you've seen some people who have been in terrible states. Um, because of it. And I, I mean, Paul told me some ter some stories about people that he knew. There's one story about a guy um, back in Manchester that he is an old friend of his. He hadn't seen for years. He went to see him in his house um, and um, went into the room at the back and it was all blacked out. The windows had like black bin liners over them. And he said, what's, what's going on with the, with the bin liners? Why have you got bin liners gaffered to the wall? Um, and, and where's your windows? And this guy had sold the windows and the window frame so that he could get money, so that he could buy some more heroin. I'd love some big pharmaceutical company to take it and do lots of trials with it. But they're not going to do it, apparently. No. I think it went really, really well. A great turnout as well. And, and, and the right kind of people, right mixture of people. What happened to those tapes? That maybe there's an irony. Maybe there's some weird kind of irony in that the tapes got burnt to burnt to cinders in the big fire in the in in the same chateau that they were they were filmed in. Ground up um, plant extract kind of looks very similar to other ground up plants that I've had before. But this is so, uh, so, 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 so special and can help so many people. What do you think motivated Paul to go out and spread the word about Ibogaine though? What, what, was, what was his motivation for doing that, do you think? I suspect the motivation was probably more to do with the fact that he wanted to give other people a way out. Paul could walk into a room with his hat on and his head down and you'd, you'd, you'd kind of never know that he was there. Um, and that's how he liked it. I mean, he was almost slightly embarrassed by that, I think. And I think that he was somehow kind of revered because of, because of that. Doubtless Ibogaine really helped Paul for extended periods of time and the medicine's mechanism of action definitely needs more research but it's not a quick fix and it's something to help kickstart a recovery journey. You still need to put in the work to stay clean. If you're interested in exploring it please just make sure you go to a place where it's legal and make sure that you've got proper professional medical supervision. Um... So we were talking about um, celebrity encounters mm. in the last episode. Um, can you remember any more celebrity encounters that were kind of noteworthy? Oh yeah, um, I'd just done a show with, uh, I was playing bass for Donovan at Glastonbury. And um, after the show, I, did, I think I did two songs as a guest performer. And uh, afterwards he said, I'm, we're just going to go to my, my mate George's house. Uh, we've got to see him. Not seen him for a while. And, uh, so we all got in his car, in Donovan's car. And I started driving down these country roads and turned through these gates and it was another country road. And it was like, this is a bit of a weird road. It's kind of narrow, like a one-way thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we got to the end of it and bang, there's George Harrison's house. It's like his mate George was George Harrison. Did you recognise the house? Yeah, I recognised the house. How did you know what his house looked like? Because I remember him buying it and it was all run down and he spent years doing it up, right. fixing what, it all up. What was he like? He's, uh, 
wow, I just couldn't even speak to him. Really? It was like, uh, 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 <laughs> I just couldn't get any words out. Uh, it was like George Harrison, I was sat next to George Harrison, who's feeding me egg and, egg and salmon sandwiches. Really? Yeah, and he said, uh, do, you want, do you want to go in the pool? Um, and I didn't really want to go in the pool. And he said, it was a hot summer's day, and he went, it's heated. <laughs> <laughs> really proud that he had a heated pool. Um, Did you go in? No, I didn't go in. I went in the house, saw his ukulele room. Just a room just full of ukuleles all over the wall. He was a big George Farnby fan. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Was he your favourite Beatle? I think George was my favourite Beatle, yeah, definitely. I met three of the Beatles. Yeah? Yeah, I met McCartney and, uh, and Ringo. Where did you meet them? Um, McCartney was at the first ever Q Awards mm. for, the, for the magazine. Met him there. And uh, I met George at uh, uh, Ringo, a self-help group. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great, great Ringo story. I got introduced to him and he's like, this is Paul. I said, hi, I'm Paul. I'm from a band called Happy Mondays from Manchester. And he went, oh, right, nice one, Paul. Nice to meet you. So anyway, I'm going now. And I was walking away. And he went, Paul, Paul, come here, come here. I went, what? He went, I'm Richard from the Beatles. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, so I met three. I met three of the uh, Beatles. Wow! And Paul McCartney, what happened when you met him? He was nice, really nice. He he's, um, he'd just been in the papers saying um, that the Mondays reminded him of uh, the Beatles during their Let It Be stage. Oh, that's a compliment. Yeah, so that was really cool. Yeah. So mm. what did you say to him? I asked him for his autograph. Did you? Never asked anyone for an autograph before. Actually, I have once, yeah, Mickey Rourke. I got Mickey Rourke's autograph. Tell me about that in camp. That was another funny story. Yeah, me and Nathan was going looking at studios. We went to the BG studio in, um, in Miami on South Beach. And the Bee Gees had a studio down there when we was looking to record Yes Please. And uh, we were just sat in the hotel bar one night, uh, at the bar. Uh, 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 in the in the hotel, and this guy came and sat next to me. I thought nothing of it. Continued drinking, talking to Nathan, and then I kind of glanced to the left of me, and it was like fucking hell, Mickey Rock sat next to me, <laughs> <laughs> and I just read that he was a Mondays fan as well. Wow! In a, in one of the magazines, in one of the glossy magazines, so I introduced myself and said I've got something for you ran upstairs and got him a CD and signed it to Mickey from Paul. Did you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what did he say? He said, oh, that's great, thanks very much. I said, can I have your autograph? He went, do you really want it? I said, yeah, of course I do. So he signed a postcard for me. Anyway, that was it. He left, he said goodbye and blah, blah, blah. And when, it came, when we came to pay our bill, the woman behind the bar said, it's OK, Mickey's got it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It's nice to hear some actual positive celebrity encounter stories. Yeah, I met some nice ones. Bowie was nice as well. Could hardly speak to him because it was Bowie. You know, he was my first childhood hero. Yeah. I could hardly speak to him. I just kind of stared at him like a weirdo. And where did you see him? <laughs> Backstage at the, I think it was the Palladium in Hollywood, facing, um, facing Capitol Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we'd just play there with the Pixies. He'd oh, come down yeah. to see the Pixies, but he saw the Mondays as well. So oh. I, 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 I couldn't speak to him. My dad spoke to him. Really? Yeah, and I sat in his Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> my dad sat in his Porsche talking to Bowie. Not my dad's Porsche, Bowie's Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, another, another guy that was really, really nice. Not an asshole at all. Really? Yeah. Good yeah. to hear that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Mark has had his share of celebrity encounters too. Meeting Paul McCartney and uh, Bill Wyman, getting their autographs. I had a long conversation with Paul McCartney. Can't remember a fucking thing I said. Paul and Sean's mum, Linda, and their dad, Derek, almost became Hollywood superstars when they were approached by a big movie producer in Los Angeles when the boys were recording there. When we were in the Roosevelt, when we first um, went to record the first album in, in America. Yeah. 
I answered the phone one day in the bedroom, in the hotel room, and Derek was still asleep. So I said, oh, just a minute. I said, you know, I'll have to get my husband. Didn't you meet oh. Bowie when you were in LA? He walked past me. Didn't say, fucking little bloke, walked past me. Fucked. So I woke Derek up and told him. And this was the fella who did Spinal Tap. Jane loves him. I'm fucking honest. I just, I wasn't awake. I wasn't, you know. So I heard Derek say he wanted to come and meet us at this restaurant in Santa Monica. And Derek said, no, I'm sorry. He said, I will not talk about the boys and the private life. We couldn't because what, you know, what the public papers and the publicity yeah. was nothing like well, what was going no. on. I just miss everything because I was more focused on getting the gig sorted. Is my guitar tuned up? What are we doing there? And didn't didn't bother about celebrities. It wasn't my forte, you know what I mean? Just I had to do, I had a job to do and that was it. So I wasn't star spotting, but yeah, there was all sorts of people. So we said, we're sorry. We will, you know, we can't come because we will not talk about the boys and the private life. So we said, well, can we come and meet you? Will you come and let us meet you too? So we said, yeah, all right. You know, you're a, a celebrity in, a, in a many people's worlds. Do you feel like that? No, 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 no. I can go out, nobody knows who I am, it's brilliant. And we went and we're talking to, they wanted to know how we met, blah, 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 this, that and the other. And believe it or not, he finished up wanting to make a film about us. <laughs> Actually, no, having said that, right, I was bringing my dog in the other day, right, and a bloke at the end of the street says, oh, I believe a Happy Mondays lives down here. No, don't know, mate. <laughs> I said, no way, you know, no. I flatly refused. Fuck that, I don't want anybody knowing where I live. Jesus, bad enough now. Oh, I didn't want anything like that. No. Derek had have gone ahead. As I said to him, well, you just, you like being a publicity seeker. No, we're just normal people and I want to stay like that. Do you never get recognised in the streets? Paul did occasionally. Well, if they do, they don't say anything. And I don't, you know. Um, I think it's because they expect you younger. You see when you're younger on things and when you see an old bloke with a beard, bald, fat belly, they think, oh. <laughs> Well, he's let himself go. <laughs> so you've had quite a lot of famous people come to see, come to your gigs through the years. Mm. Talk to me about that. Do you know what? I can't remember any. Robbie Williams, you were. Fr Have we talked about your friendship with Robbie? Yeah, he came yeah, and rescued me, didn't he? Yeah, he did. We talked about. Came and rescued me. Yeah. Do you know? There's not much to talk about. There's not much left. There's tons left, Paul. Is there? We've not even moved to LA yet. Oh, right. One, can you hear this? That's very loud, Danny. Big Arm was going from strength to strength at this time. I actually found some behind the scenes footage from a gig Big Arm did in London from around that time. John Pennington hired it was just like a mixing desk full of um, giant pieces of iron mm. and we had to carry it up the staircase I remember. I remember. including Derek and as we were doing it it was like right on a serious note if anybody lets go now everyone else is dead <laughs> weren't it it was like a 48 yeah, it was track pretty cumbersome, it was like, why yeah, have yeah, we yeah. got this yeah. <laughs> yeah. this is what we need this is exactly what we need. Yeah, yeah, like, John, yeah. it's two flights of stairs here, mate. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> two flights of stairs. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. 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 And the promoter that night was never forgotten. I always remember you brought it to attention in one of your uh, texts, uh, Angela, the uh, the owner of the club yeah. announcing that he had a big penis. <laughs> remember? Yeah. That was big arm, and I've got a big cock. Well, Angela and Paul were there. Yeah, 
he were great. And then as soon as Angela and Paul left, it were like, can we have a drink? No. <laughs> hey? <laughs> We're okay. still talking about like 2005, six kind oh. of. That's where we were up to. Well, no, 2000 and 2007, mm. summer of 2007. Um, you used to get offered various DJ gigs as you know, celebrity DJ. Kind yeah, of thing. there was a little rock star DJ tour thing going on yeah. with different different um, yeah. people out of bands DJing for an hour at different right. various clubs yeah so, so I got offered one of them o got... over here in in the in the, uh, the States yeah so you had one night in Denver mm -hmm. one night about a week later in LA and then mm -hmm. one night a week or so later in New York yeah so before this you were still struggling with drugs yeah but you'd started to abuse I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want other people to pick up on this but there's a drug you can buy over the counter in boots in England oh, right, which yeah, you right, right. developed a massive addiction to I remember you were on that. like a packet a day of them yeah and one of the co-ingredients was paracetamol which in America is called acetaminophen I can never yeah, pronounce I that. can never say it yeah, um, Tylenol will call it yeah which is extremely dangerous to the liver mm. this is all relevant to the story that I'm about to tell. So um, so you had this tour and we thought, well, we'll take the boys, we'll make a holiday of it. So we'll do Denver, spend a few days in the Rocky Mountains after the gig. Then we'll fly to, to LA. We rented a place by the beach in LA for a week. Then we went to New York and we rented a place in the East Village. Mm -hmm. So it was like a holiday slash DJ tour. Mm -hmm. So you were like, well, um, I'm addicted to these over-the-counter tablets. But if I'll, I'll buy, I'll get four boxes of them. Yeah. Which in normal person's dosages would have probably lasted you, one packet would have lasted you a week if you had a headache all yeah. the time. Yeah, normal. Um, so I said, well, you won't be able to take in, you know, a vast quantity. So it was like, we'll get four boxes, you take two in, I'll take two in. And that'll do. And uh, so we flew to Denver, we arrived checked in the hotel in Denver and the kids were young they were like seven and eight so we couldn't all go to the gig so I mm -hmm. stayed in the hotel with the boys yeah and you went to do your DJ set in Denver <laughs> and then it's about two o'clock in the morning there was I heard this kerfuffle outside the room mm -hmm. and struggling to open the door and you literally fell into the hotel room mm. absolutely drunk as a skunk which, oh, was, dear. which was kind of unusual because you weren't really a drinker like when you relapse you didn't really tend to relapse on alcohol it, it was no. mainly drugs yeah so you were a terrible mess and I, I i had no idea what kind of impression you left with the people at the club but you said that it went well <laughs> they obviously plied you with a lot of vodka i think mm. i'd even spoken to the promoter before and said don't give him any alcohol but obviously that mm -hmm. fell on deaf ears i remember being up in the dj booth with him and uh, we were kind of just looking through his collection and talking about music. And he pulled out a single of Sister Rose oh. by Ian Brown. And uh -huh. Told me that he, he had worked on that. And I hadn't heard that he had collaborated with Ian. And so that yeah. just blew my mind. Um, I think he saw my face light up and he just handed me the single. So uh, I've still got that. And, and oh. uh, it's perished. So I remember that. And I remember being so happy he was, he was there. and. Um, then I have to cut to the clubs over people are gone um, Paul my co-DJ uh, Michael Trundle and I think our bartender Caesar were, were hanging out at the bar everybody's on two feet and able to have a conversation and it was great cut to us driving downtown and uh, this was this was where I believe you were, right? You were at the hotel downtown. In the hotel, yeah, with the kids. And uh, by the time we'd gotten to the hotel, Michael and I um, had to I had pull Paul out of the car. And uh, he had one arm around me and one arm around Michael. And we were walking into the hotel and we realized we didn't have a room number. We didn't have a floor number. We... We didn't really have any information. So um, if I remember correctly, uh, Michael stayed posted up 
with Paul and I went to the front desk and I said, it's Paul Ryder. He's <laughs> staying here. Uh, we need to know what room number it is. And, um, and so we took him up to the, ho up to the hotel room. And, uh, I think we had a key. Oh. We had a key to, to get into the room because nobody came and opened the doors. And I seem to remember you waking up and, and just a silhouette uh, of mm -hmm. you in the, the background and kind of surprised. And uh, we sat Paul, Paul down and said, uh, are you going to be all right? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be fine. And um, and then that was that that was the closure of the night. The next mm -hmm. day, I believe we got a really uh, nice, gracious email from him. And he said, you know, sorry, guys, I, I'd had some ibuprofen earlier. I think he was just hella drunk, wasn't he? I think he'd just been drinking a lot of alcohol. And that's the thing. The altitude will do that to you. Like one drink out here may as well be the equivalent of three or oh, four, depending really? on where you live. Okay. And right. so, um, and, you, and, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to turn down the opportunity to drink way too much with Paul. So, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think it just knocked off of his feet, um, being yeah. at alt altitude and having uh, having all that free alcohol. Um, and then we spent a few days up in the Rocky Mountains. We rented a cabin. Oh, yeah, that Orleans. was nice. Yeah. yeah, that was nice. Yeah. And then by the time we got to L.A., these four boxes of these painkillers yeah. had gone. And you right. were like, I need to see a doctor, I need to see a doctor, I need to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. So the next week in L.A. was punctuated by you seeking out different private doctors and getting prescriptions doctor shopping for morphine yeah doctor shopping yeah, and you'd yeah. get like okay i've got enough now to last till the end of the trip and then two days later it's like i need to see a doctor again like it was just Ooh. it was madness yeah and that's oh do you remember when that was the trip when you met up with russell brand Oh Remember? right, yeah, he yeah. Him and the, and the two yeah, he took me to a meeting, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, he was nice, wasn't he? Yeah. I never met him, but you, you were very. Yeah, so I was doctor yeah. shopping. You were doctor shopping. You were in, and, and we we spent the week in LA. You did your gig in LA, and then we went to New York, and again more doctors, more. I mean, it was pure madness. Yeah, and it it overshadowed the whole trip. And I remember saying to you, "You can't come back to England. I, I'm not letting mm -hmm. you come back." and go back to that house in this bit. This isn't, this isn't t tenable. Oh, I thought I said I can't go back. But you, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, I just said I can't do this anymore. This yeah. That was my breaking point, that mm. holiday ruined by you going to various doctors. Mm -hmm. Like, ridiculously so. So the decision was made that you were going to go into rehab and, mm -hmm. and originally it was like, well, I just need to do a detox. I'm like, no, you need to, you need proper, full-on therapy. Mm -hmm. So I flew back home from New York with the kids and you flew out west to L.A. to go into a rehab yes. originally for a month. Yeah. Tell me what that was like. I thought I was just going for 30 days, 30 day lie down, do, <laughs> do a detox and feel good enough to use again after 30 days. But it turned into um, three months which I'd never done before out of all the other 11 rehabs I've been to, I'd only ever done 30 days. And, um, and it wasn't successful, but it three months. It wasn't successful? Yeah, after just, just oh, doing 30 days. Oh, the previous ones, yeah, right, okay. After just doing 30 days. Ooh. So this one in Venice, on Venice, in Venice Beach, was like, ended up being there three months, mm -hmm. which gave me time to get some therapy, proper therapy. Mm. Um, and some uh, some grounding on a in a self help group, mm -hmm. which was really good, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was it was successful this time. Mm -hmm. It was three months of well, three months of therapy turned into six years of therapy, mm -hmm. which was uh, which helped me tremendously. Well, the other benefit of that program was that when you came out after the three months, you did part-time like you did nighttime mm, sessions I carried you, on, for about yeah. six months or something I carried on having uh, uh, outpatient treatment mm. so in that three months that you were in rehab I remember you calling me one day and saying I can't live in England anymore yeah. if I'm going to stay clean I have to live in LA and mm. I was like all right <laughs> all right move to, let's move to LA and I had a company there was mm -hmm. stuff going on 
but I just thought we have to do whatever's necessary in order to. Yeah. I, I do believe if I'd have gone back to England, I probably won't be here now. No, I think that too. Mm -hmm. You were on a self-destruct mission, really, and it yeah. just, just didn't seem to work. Mm. Maybe it was because there were too many triggers there. Yeah. I don't know. I needed time away from everything that had gone on with the Mondays, everything that had gone on in our private life, everything. I needed time away for everything mm -hmm. from England. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did it. And it's like... But you see, often people ask me, why did you move to L.A.? And it's a bit like, well, why not? Like, why wouldn't you want to live in a beautiful place? Yeah. Where yeah. the sun shines most days. Yeah. And there's tremendous opportunities to do stuff. Yeah. You know, it's the, the hub of, of the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I was in the entertainment industry. So were you. Mm -hmm. I just felt like it was a better place for our kids to be brought up and, yeah, and, and a better place for both of us to to grow as human mm. beings and yeah. it was it was a massive risk i didn't know i didn't know whether you were going to come out of that rehab after the three months and go, do what you did when you came out of antigua and go and get crack on the way home yeah or not yeah so i was fully prepared to abandon the mission and go back if you came out and relapsed yeah but we we literally left the house with two suit the boys had two suitcases each i had two suitcases <laughs> oh we were heartbroken absolutely yeah. heartbroken not so much about paul mortified the boys how could you do that take sunny and chico away um, from us yeah uh, yeah yeah absolutely mortified but Linda at least had her best friend, drummer Gaz Whelan's mum, Sandra, to keep her company. My mum and Linda, Paul's mum, Linda Ryder, probably first met at one of the early Mondays gigs, probably probably one of the big ones because they weren't allowed to come to any other gigs. We didn't like family coming, apart from obviously Derek was always there. Uh, and then they hit off straight away. I think they had a, a mutual liking of, uh, of alcohol and music and rock and roll. So every Wednesday night, yeah, my mum used to go down to Linda's house for what they call rock and roll Wednesdays. And my mum would drink a bottle of rum and Linda would drink vodka, a bottle of vodka, and they would play rock and roll music. And that went on for 30 years, 30 odd years they've been doing that, yeah, to this day. They're both 80, or 80, I think Linda might be 80, 81. And they wonder where we get it from, eh? You know what, you know what? There's, have you seen the Leonard Cohen documentary? There's a woman on it talking about, she says, uh, musicians and and writers and all that, she went, you can always tell, they said, with the males, because they always have crazy mothers. What's so funny about that, Sandra? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you went and... I found somewhere to rent in... Uh, in Topanga, in Topanga. Which was a fully furnished house, which was great because we didn't have anything. There was even food in the cupboards. So that was <laughs> that was that house was owned by uh, Kadeem Hardison. Yes, who's a really lovely guy, famous actor who was in a different life. A different life, I think it was called. Yeah, or a different world. Yeah, I saw him in a movie the other night. Actually, yeah. he was really good. And uh, we were dealing with his mum, who's Beth Ann Hardison, who was. Naomi Campbell's. She was the manager. first black she, supermodel. Yeah, she was. Back in the pictures 70s. pictures were all over the walls. Yeah. And went in. Nicely decorated. Yeah, and Topanga was just a beautiful place to land. Like, Topanga's in the, the Santa Monica Mountains, but it's only about a 40 minute drive to the centre of Hollywood. But it's like. Yeah, really now, half an hour to Malibu. Yeah, less than that. Less than that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was just beautiful, scenic, quiet, peaceful. Yeah. Um, but really close to all the act, close to the beach. So yeah, why wouldn't beach. you want to move to California? Yeah, why not do that? And you know, moving here was the first time I'd ever been called an artist as well. You really? Know? Oh yeah, yeah. Like people, you know, when you meet people and you say I'm a bass player and I'm in a band, blah 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 blah. Oh, you're an artist then. It's like, oh, am I? I'm really an artist. <laughs> wow, that's nice. Um, it's, the whole psyche around stuff like that is, is different from Manchester. Yeah. You know, you, you get, in Manchester, you're you, you more likely to get, you're in a band, who do you think you are? You know, mm. but over here, it's like, oh, great, you're an artist. Come mm. and meet some other artists. 
Well, it's really common in LA, isn't it? I mean, oh, yeah. the whole city is populated by musicians, yeah. And yeah. actors, and producers, and yeah. I just, I mean, I think it's the best thing that we ever did, really. Even though I, at the time when I moved here, I wasn't convinced that it was going to last. Mm -hmm. um, so you went and found a house for us to rent for the first six months. Yeah. And then I think the day you came out of rehab was the day we flew in and you met us at the airport. And I didn't know what to expect when you were coming to meet us at the airport. Oh, yeah, you'd never uh, seen the house before, had I you? I had no idea we what didn't state have... you'd be in either. I didn't know whether you'd go and have a drink like, mm. straight fresh out of rehab. Yeah, we didn't have telephones with cameras on, so you didn't know what kind of house you was going no, to. I had no idea. A nice but, surprise, though, right? Yeah, it was nice, except... It was freezing cold when... Oh, that, that's another thing. I thought I was moving to LA and it was hot every day. I didn't realise there was actually a winter here. So mm. I came with all summer clothes and it was freezing mm. and cloudy and raining, actually. That's another thing with Spanger. It's got its own climate. Yeah, and it was cloudy and foggy in the mornings. Um, and the, the heating in the house wasn't working, but there was an open fire. Yeah. <laughs> but we couldn't work out how to open the chimney. So when we when we burned anything in the fire, all the smoke came in the house. Do you remember that? Yeah, of course we do. Couldn't and we breathe. arrived, it was the 18th of December, which was seven days before Christmas. Yeah. So it was just a case of running around trying to get a Christmas tree and Christmas presents for the boys. and. Mm. I didn't even know where the shops were. No, I didn't. I had no idea. I remember that if a neighbour... Telling us where we should go. Yeah, if you go down to the other end of the canyon, there's shops there. Yeah. I was like, oh, really? I just thought yeah. it was one shop in Topanga and that was yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, Topanga is very much like the Rocky Mountains, really, isn't it? It's yeah. very kind of, it's doesn't, it's not classic LA at all, even though mm -hmm. it is. I mean, there are a lot of beautiful canyons in LA, like Laurel Canyon and Benedict Canyon, all through those Santa Monica Mountains. But I think LA gets a bad rap internationally. I think like, in England, we envisage big, wide freeways and mm. plastic surgery and boob jobs. Mm -hmm. That's what LA see and, and fake people. Yeah. But there's actually so much more. Much, much to more. This city. Much more. That I, th I just think the longer I'm here, the more I really love it. Yeah, me too. Um, Best move we uh, we did. Yeah, it really was. Because I wanted to move to New York, really. I, mm. I was more interested in being near New York, but I'm glad you yeah. forced my hand and made, made us move here. Well, it was a, it was a toss-up between New York and, and here. Mm. I, I think because we had the kids, mm -hmm. it was more kid-friendly, Los Angeles. So yeah. I, did that. I don't know. I mean, now it would, hands down, I'd pick LA. Yeah, me day. too. I mean, to live in New York, you'd want to be in Manhattan, and to be in Manhattan, you need a massive amount of money yeah, exactly. to have a decent life, yeah. or else we could have lived in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, so we moved, and on day one, we went to the local school and signed the boys up. We did. And they put them in the wrong class, and they, remember they were like a year ahead, <laughs> because the grade numbers were different. Oh, yes. But even the school, like the mountainous backdrop to the school was just beautiful. It's like yeah. a, a dream school for your kids. Yeah. Um, and it was all free. We didn't have to pay for private schooling or anything. Which was good. So that first six months, you did you do some, D, I think you did a little bit of DJing, didn't you? I think I did a bit of DJing, yeah. Yeah. And... Um, you, you went to all these meetings and you know, three times a week sessions at the rehab? I yeah, think it was. three outpatient, three nights a week. Also, I went to uh, a separate therapist, so it was four nights. I was doing meetings every day, which I really needed. Mm. Um, and things were looking good. Mm. Those daily meetings interfered with his social life. Some of the first friends we made in Los Angeles were Dolph Taylor, who used to be the drummer in Spear of Destiny, Stiff Little Fingers and the Tom Robinson Band, and his wife, Alison. They were really surprised when they invited us round to their house, and Paul promptly left to go to a meeting. Paul probably was, like, socially anxious, so, oh, I can't go, but I'll take you and I'll go to a meeting. Back in those days, he was going to meetings every single day, Right. For at least an hour. I thought it was weird. Yeah. yeah. But then I didn't know anything, so that's why <laughs> I thought it was weird. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't, I mean, obviously I knew who he was, but I didn't even know that he had a, a problem. Oh, a, a, okay. You know, a drinking problem or whatever problem he was right. dealing with at the time. Right. But so, you know, I mean, 
You know, they, he was in his darkest days when, when we first yeah. met him. When we, well, when in those were. days, he looked dreadful, if you yeah. recall. He looked awful. You know, a couple of years later, he was a different man, but he was a shell. Of a, oh, of was a, he? Yeah, he was really a broken, nervous, shaky type of person. Then a couple of years later, he was so much better. Can you talk about the detail, like, for people who don't know much about what rehab is like, can you talk about what what goes on in a rehab, like, what happens, what what's it? Well, the first thing you've got to do is get detoxed. Mm -hmm. What's uh, that mean? You've got to slowly come off whatever your drug of choice is. Right. You know, mine was, I was known as a dustbin, because <laughs> I'd take anything. And, and large amounts of it. Yeah. So um, I was detoxing off all kinds of different things um, that had taken over the years. But, but you didn't have to, I mean, presumably you were only detoxing off what you were addicted to at that point, weren't you? You didn't have to detox yeah, off you... alcohol because you weren't drinking, or am I wrong? Oh no, I was drinking. Oh, were you? I never yeah. knew that. I was drinking, yeah. What, just before you went in? I don't think you were. I yeah, think... uh, I oh, ended actually, up really drunk in that's New true. York. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. So I know, you, I remember you being really drunk in Denver, so you carried on drinking and in New York. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I know that at the time? And that's selective memory on your behalf. Why? What happened? Remind me. I don't remember that. I was just like, like you described in Denver, only it happened in New York as well. Oh, did it? Oh, yeah. I don't like that from my memory. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you got a detox and then. The next thing you do is... Um, well, tell me what detoxing is. Like, what, Tell me what that feels well, like. Well, I was, I was coming off uh, opiates. Yeah. So it was hell. You know, I mean, it was a good detox. I mean, they try and get you off, off the opiates as comfortably as possible. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, probably 90 degrees outside, weather, hot. And I was freezing cold. I had two two t-shirts on, two jumpers, two coats, hat, glove, mm. woolly socks. Sat in the sun, freezing cold because I'm coming off these opiates. And what does that feel like physically? Hell. But, like, if you can imagine it. hell, that like, is hell. What are the symptoms? So uncomfortable, so painful. It's like it's like you, the inside of your body wants to burst out of your skin and like shout hey <laughs> you know it's it's horrible horrible thing just to, to have to go through do you throw up you have diarrhea do you get oh yeah yeah headache? but you can you can control all that with uh, medication mm. but yeah it does happen mm. you know you, you you try to do it as comfortably as possible but mm. it's impossible to do it without feeling like your insides are bursting out of your skin so if somebody's addicted right now, do you want to encourage them to go and do a detox? So it sounds like, a, like, a, were you determined that you were going to get through it? Or? Yeah, well, it's better than doing a cold turkey. Right. And when you've run out of money and shit to sell, you know, what are you going to do? You've got no money to buy any more drugs. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. I better do a detox. Right. I better get off this stuff. You were really privileged though because you had money behind you. Like, what, what would mm. you advise people to do who don't have the means to go into a private detox clinic? I know in the UK you can ask your doctor. Yeah, for a on the national in the In the US, if you've got health insurance, you can go into rehab for a month, mm -hmm. which probably isn't enough. But no. what would you advise people who don't feel they've got the means? Well, there's charities, there's lots of charities. Music, if you're a musician, there's a place called Music Cares. Mm. will will uh, help you get in somewhere mm -hmm. and there's other a lot of rehabs offer scholarships for every six patients they take they get they take one in for free so mm. you can always inquire yeah. if they've got um, rooms for anybody I think that the key is to be absolutely motivated to to stop isn't it yeah I think if a rehab sees that you really mean it then, mm. you know it's it, just try and try your best, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to, you've got to want to do it. Mm. You've got to really want to do it. Did you want to do it the previous times when it failed? I wanted to at the time, but when I was left kind of, I was left naked. 
because I didn't have any therapy. I didn't have any group therapy. I didn't have any therapist to speak to. I was just done the detox and, and some work on myself, but not enough. Mm. You know, so I was left, I was left raw mm -hmm. and couldn't handle it. I just couldn't even handle real life. Mm -hmm. I know, I was going to say, let's have a break, it's too hot. <sighs> Gutted. Yeah, it's, you know, when you've spent quite a bit of time away from someone, you still know they're out there. And there's always going to be that time to catch up and have a brew and a chat. And it's that that never going to see him or speak to him again. That's uh, an awful thought. I work with a lot of musicians and they've all got demons of one sort or another, um, yeah. you know, and and that's part of what makes them what they are. It's part, part of what comes out in their art, really. I was really, really sad not to be at the funeral. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I would have I would have loved to have been there, really. Devastated, really. Yeah, really upset. I mean, last year, uh, my, f my dad passed away. I remember, funnily enough, just bef just after my dad passed away, Paul sent me a text saying, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear about you, you, your, your dad, you know, keep the faith, all this stuff, and, you know, really nice text. I said, oh, thanks, Paul. I had no idea that shortly afterwards he'd, he'd be meeting his maker as well, you know. It's just... Um, no, it was a shock. Big shock. It's still... Still strange, you know, thinking that he's not about. Yeah. I still ex expect to get that humorous yeah. little text off him now and again, you know, and uh, yeah. knowing that that's not going to happen again, it is weird, and um, it does. You can't help but get sentimental about it, you know. It's um, it really does remind me of how special those times were back in the day, you know, with Big Arm, you know, and the the, the good memories. And I'm glad, really, you know. Coming up on the next episode. How can he go around un under the name Happy Mondays and do this? It's kind of ruining everything I'd worked for for like nearly 30 years. He was just ruining it and he, he did end up ruining it. It took us many, many years to build it back up. I was shitting it because I'd not seen the guys for 17 years. And um, when we first met after 17 years in the town, it was a bit bizarre. It was nice to meet everybody, but I was still a bit like, Oof. are we all over it now? Are we all clean? Can we all, you know, actually do this? That was legendary, that party. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was Paul Cook, the drummer yeah. of the Sex Pistols, who yeah. knew from London was in town, so he came. Mm -hmm. Siobhan was there. Mm -hmm. Nick Rhodes' ex-wife was ex -wife there. Ex-wife was there. Mm -hmm. And Dolphin Allison were there. Nick the Greek Nick and the Sarah. Greek. With that. It seemed a good idea, but I, I didn't know if I could play and be with them. I've not been with them for 20 years since then. The, you know, the, and it was like, none of them had changed. And it was like, wow, there's you know, lots to catch up on. Typical Sean Ryder way of doing things. Um, he announced in the press that the original Mondays was getting back together and doing this huge tour. Like, it's like, oh, really? Well, where, where's the phone call? He just announced it in the press, like his usual, like his usual self. We're playing out with the acoustic version of Big Arms Flashbacks. Please join us again, same time, same place, next week. Bag yourself some Big Arm merch by visiting our shop at paulrider.tv and please join our patrons club at the founding members rate. That's patreon.com forward slash the Paul Ryder tapes. Perks are coming up for all of our lovely patrons very soon and special thanks to Kieran Cuddy, Joseph Davis, David Green, Paul Larkin and Chris Barton for joining us. And if you want to listen to the next episode in podcast form, it's available right now on all of the podcast platforms. 
have a brilliant week thank you so much for being here thank you to all of our guests and of course big thanks to the star of the show as usual the one and only the late great paul anthony Ryder. You taught me things I never knew I told you what to say and do You showed me one and one is not two There's just one song that reminds me of you And when you hear it, you'll know it too Flashbacks I'm having flashbacks Glistening Production <laughs> my mum as she says has got more going than me like she says like what's your perfect night out and i say well sat in a pub in an old man's pub about four people there with a pint of guinness and a book and she's like you're bloody boring you you know get out partying and like she goes out and has her friends and dances and all that and i'm like oh 